Member of Parliament. And just give a little picture of, because Kabul then was obviously a very different town today. Jazz bars, yes. um, ice cream, the Paris of the East. Yes, then it was, yes. And you said it was, for you, you found it more liberal in those days than Delhi was when you first went there. Yes, when I first came to India in 1976, I found Delhi to be a lot more conservative than Kabul was uh, those days in the 1970s and, and, and a very different city. And I was raised in Kabul and then did my schools there and uh, then came for my higher studies, my university, to Simla. And I will tell you how I ended up in Simla. My cousin was studying in uh, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I was with him in that hostel. And he one day, the second or third of our coming here, took me to the Connaught place. It is the month of July, so you imagine the heat of the place. And Kabul is a very, very cool place. So I told him, uh, Masum, is there another place in India that I can go to that will look like Kabul, that is a bit cooler? He said, yes, there's a place called Simla. And I said, uh, do they have schools and universities? He said, sure. Let's go there. I said, let's go. So after a day or two, we went to Simla. And allow me to talk about this in detail, Mr. Jalalimpur. And as we arrive in Simla on, those, on that little wonderful train, going through the mountains and the trees and the clouds and the monsoons and the rains, we straight went from the railway station towards the university. And there is a lane from uh, the station to the university where you have those huge trees with langurs playing in those trees from tree to tree, from tree to tree. The monsoon and the drizzle of rain, and we were walking. And I told myself, I didn't tell my cousin, I told myself, I said, school or no school, I'm not leaving this place. I'm staying here. And that's how I stayed in Simla, six years, with memories unimaginable, and with an impression that a boy of 18 gets has still left a remarkable mark on my personality and hopefully the future as well. So you, um, at that point you learned Hindi, became very fluent in Hindi, and discovered Urdu literature. Yes, yes, well, well Hindi or, uh, or, or uh, the language that, that generally people speak in India is a different story. We were already as youngsters familiar with Hindi in Kabul in Afghanistan because of Hindi movies. Because of Devanand, Raj Kapoor, Dilip Kumar, you know. And uh, Hema Malini and of course uh, Zina Taman and, uh, and all of that. And the music, uh, probably we hear as much of Lata Mangeshkar as you do in India or of Manade, or of Muhammad Rafi, or of uh, Mukesh, or Kishore Kumar, I mean, you name a singer of that generation, I'll tell you more about it than you know. So it's, it's, it's because of that, is the Hindi effect was not from similar, it was from the Indian, Afghan cultural uh, affinity symbiosis. and exchange and symbiosis uh, for generations. And you also um, apparently were a very dressy student. The other students were all messing around in sort of fab India, and you were wearing three-piece suits with an umbrella. Is this true? That's a propaganda against me. I, 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 One of your best friends told I, me that. Yes, my best friends would tell me that then too. Well, I was more conservatively dressed than others, but not in three-piece suits. No, more conservative dress, yes. And uh, also enjoyed um, Western movies. You used to go and see Peter O'Toole movies. Oh yes. No. oh, yes. Oh, yes. We, 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 we were familiar with Western movies and Indian movies from the cultural scene in Kabul. Kabul cinemas played uh, Hindi movies and also Western movies. And I remember so many of the people coming from Pakistan to Kabul to watch Indian movies in those days where they could not see Indian movies in, 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 in Pakistan. And also Western movies. But while in Simla, uh, I did see more of the English movies, British movies, than I did Indian movies. There was a lovely cinema hall called Rivoli uh, down the hill below the, be below the ridge in Simla. Those who are familiar with Simla, raise your hands. 
Similites or familiar, good, good, nice enough crowd of familiar with Simla. And I used to go and see um, uh, English movies, old English movies, P2 Tool and uh, Alan Bates, Goodbye Mr. Chimps, uh, To Serve With Love, you know, movies like that. But unlike other students from that idyllic student world where you were independent for the first time, not under the eyes of your elder brothers or your, uh, or your Parents, family, hmm. but went back from there to Peshawar, where the civil war, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, all that impinged on your life on a much more serious way. In a lot of serious way. One day, I was walking from my hostel, which was uh, the YMCA, to my college, which was the government college. Before that, I was in SDB, Sanad and Dharam Bargava College, and then I went to government college. I was walking, um, uh, there is a bazaar called Lakar Bazaar, those who are familiar with, 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 uh, with um, uh, Simla. And I was walking towards my college, two girls were coming from the opposite direction. And they were talking among themselves. One of them told the other that last night the Soviet forces arrived in Afghanistan and I overheard this, these two girls talking about the invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union. Suddenly my perspective changed. Suddenly my pride, my honor, my dignity as an Afghan, it changed. And I said, hell, my country has been invaded, how come? I decided to be back in Afghanistan and the sooner the better. And that's how I decided in, within a few months to go to, to Peshawar and to Quetta and to Balochistan to see our refugees and then later to join the Afghan resistance against the former Soviet Union. And so what was your role in the Mujahideen? Uh, more a, a, a role of uh, a political role, less military role, more um, within the offices of the resistance, more <clears throat> in contact with the foreign community, with, with the press, with the media. And, uh, because you spoke very good English, unlike yes, most Afghans. Yes, yes, yes. And occasionally also I did go inside Afghanistan. Um, and ultimately, when the Mujahideen defeated the, the Soviets, you became part of the Mujahid, a junior part of the Mujahideen <coughs> government. Yes, uh, when, when, when the Soviet Union withdrew, when we went to Afghanistan, uh, I became the deputy foreign minister of the uh, new government and was there for a while. Then troubles in fighting and all of that began, and then I went away from it and... Just give a little picture of that for people that aren't familiar with that. The Mujahideen started fighting among themselves. Masood was rocketing Kabul from the Panjshir Valley. Um, and everything was falling apart. A period of great disillusionment for you, presumably. You'd fought for this new Afghanistan and it was falling apart in front of your eyes. Uh, yes, that period of uh, uh, infighting between the uh, Mujahideen organizations was a very sad period for Afghanistan. And that also brought about the rule of the Taliban to Afghanistan. Initially, the Afghan people, majority of the Afghan people, supported the Taliban rule as, uh, as uh, a salvation from a, uh, a, uh, a situation where there was complete collapse of law and order, complete uh, And you initially agreed with them? You thought the Taliban I, I, initially... I very much initially agreed with the Taliban. I rather supported the Taliban initially, like many other Afghans. Later, when, when they became uh, abusive uh, of our country's culture and values and unity, and when we saw that there was immense foreign influence, in this case from our neighbor Pakistan in their ranks, that's when we began to resist them. And this is obviously extremely difficult because you're based by this stage now back in Pakistan. Yes. Uh, but you are part of the uh, forces that are beginning to line up to fight the Taliban. So yes. The, so the, the ISI are not favorable to you? They, no, no, they father. were not happy, yes, of course. And ultimately your father was assassinated. Yeah. Yes, during our struggle for the reunification of the Afghan purpose, uh, when we started an intra-Afghan dialogue so Afghanistan can be retaken from this creeping invasion of Pakistan, uh, we knew we would suffer and that's how my father was assassinated. Two men on a motorbike? And then two men came on a motorbike. I was not uh, uh, with him that day. He went to prayers and went on his way back. He was assassinated. And um, uh, that's how our story then against the Taliban began to develop and, and uh, grow. And then, and then at one stage, at that point, you did what many people would have thought was a completely crazy thing. Although you were a known anti-Taliban figure, mm -hmm. you insisted for your family honor 
to mm. take your father's body back to be buried in the family graveyard outside Kandahar. Yes, yes, I, I took my father's body. People told me, lots of people told me not to go because they said the Taliban would wage a war on you or, or kill you or arrest you. I said, no, I will go with him. And we went inside Afghanistan. Of course, the people were there to support us and we uh, buried him in our own uh, uh, cemetery, in our own graveyard. And after doing that, I returned to Pakistan. And the next time you entered Afghanistan was immediately after 9-11 when you did an even more crazy thing of going in alone on a motorbike. Yes. <laughs> maybe, maybe yeah, like I did that, that, yes. This, well, I mean, this is a, uh, just to give the picture, 9-11 well, has happened, America's about to uh, invade the country. It's one of the most tense moments in modern history. Well, there are, <laughs> there are lots of young people here. When you are younger, you are more courageous, you know. Getting older, you become a bit cautious. I was young then. If you call 40 young, then I was 40. Younger. If you call 40 young, yes, if you call 40 young. <laughs> so you went li literally... Got hang on, about. hang on, hang on. And, and it was the first time, and it was the first time when I was, when I was inside Afghanistan, secretly uh, in a taxi with four of my colleagues at the Taliban check post, a young Talib came to me, uh, and they were searching the car. The others got out of the car. I didn't, because I had a little satellite phone next to me. I wanted to hide that. And he came and opened the, the door. He was a very polite chap. He said, Uncle, would you come up? I was very angry when he told me uncle. It's the first time that I heard some, someone telling me uncle. So that kind, of <laughs> that kind of reminded me that people at 40 can be called uncle. <laughs> um, and so, but, but you went, you then got, from that point, you went back and got a motorbike? What was the story? No, <clears throat> the motorbike was two days before that. From Pakistan into Afghanistan, we were six people on uh, three motorbikes. We entered the Afghan territory secretly, but on the main road, and went into Afghanistan, went into Kandahar, spent the night in one house. The gentleman from that household is right now with me here. And then into, into another house, and then the next day we went uh, towards central Afghanistan in a taxi. And Sooner or later, the Taliban le learnt that you were there. Yes. And began to try and hunt you down. Yes. Describe that. Oh. Uh, well, uh, we knew they were going to come after us one day or the other, together with their um, uh, uh, troops from Pakistan and, and, and some Arab elements that were there with them as well. But they could not come to attack us in the villages. And... Uh, uh, Eventually they did, but, but by that time we had already been in the, in the middle of uh, the mountainous area of the country, in mountains. And uh, well, that's a long story. I mean, you want to tell me the Give whole thing? Give a little bit about the, 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 the time that uh, the, the man, you were starving, the man fed you, the Taliban. That, that's my favorite of those stories. Oh, that story. Now, are you sure these young people want to see hear sad stories or, or do you want to have, hear happy stories? That one too? Sad ones. Okay. Happy ones? All the ones. Okay. We were in a mountain. We were attacked. I'm a Gandhian in lots of ways. In lots of ways. In lots of ways. In lots of ways. But we were attacked, but I did not want to fight. Uh, we captured some Taliban, and I told my people, I said, we must let them go back to their homes, and we must not fire at them. So the only alternative for us was to, to not fight and to abandon the place. And that's what we did. We were 150 people or so, and I asked everyone to go back to their villages, and 11 of us, 12 of us, we went towards a destination far away, uh, God knows, 50, 60, 80 kilometers. On foot, in on the foot, mountains. On foot, on foot, on foot, entirely. After 36 hours or so of walking on foot, we arrived in a place, uh, a little hut, and we saw a farmer with a shovel on his, on his shoulders, came close to us, and he kind of recognized us because you could hear 
he was listening to the radios and to the news, recognized us as to who we were and who I was. He fed us. It was about 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And then we moved on into another district. In the middle of the night, we could not find room there. So we came back the entire distance by 7 the next morning after about, God knows, over 40, 45 hours of walking. We were back in the same place. And this man fed us again and told us, don't go in that direction. You may be caught by the Taliban forces. Go into the mountainous areas and fed us and gave us badams and bread and everything. And we went there. And uh, within four or four, five hours of our departure, the Taliban had come, had beaten him, but he did not confess that we were in his house. And he said he doesn't know who we were. And, and, and that's, how, that's, how, that's how we were saved. But the interesting part is, when I became the president of the country within 20 days of that event or within a month of that event, I sent him a message to come to see me in Kabul. He didn't care. He said, you are the king now. I don't want to come and see you there. <laughs> he didn't come. He stayed in his village. He stayed in his farm. And only after a year when I visited that province and I sent him a message again, I said, now I'm in your province. Now do come and see me. Then he came for a breakfast and very carelessly said, how are you? I said, I'm good. <laughs> and <laughs> lovely man that was. That's how the story is. <laughs> and the time you came nearest to being killed wasn't, in fact, from the Taliban. It was the Americans letting off their weaponry. It was the American bomb, yes. We had almost taken parts of the country. I shouldn't say taken parts of the country. Taken implies a degree of force. There was no force. The people took the country themselves. It was the Afghan people who wanted the change. Uh, I was lucky to be there with them at that time. So it's the Afghan people who took the place. We were in the mountains. They came and looked for us. They found us. It's a long story. And when we were down in, uh, towards Kandahar uh, in, in a district headquarters, the Americans had also arrived. Uh, one day, it, it's the month of Ramadan, and I was feeling very cold. Uh, cold. So I wanted to go and warm myself up on top of a hill where some people were sitting in sunshine. And as I walk, was walking towards that hill, someone called me from behind and said, well, some elders have arrived from another, another district. And they were notables, um, uh, elderly people. So I went back and sat there. And the moment I put a quilt around me, the windows blew inside and the, and the doors blew inside. And uh, the room was almost in, in, in total destruction. And uh, first we thought it was an attack by the Taliban or their uh, other uh, foreign friends. But later on, as we recollected, we learned that this was an American bomb. And it hit the spot where I was to be sitting. So luckily I was saved. And then you, soon after that, you got a phone call from another friend of the festival, Liz Doucette. It was, it was about uh, half an hour from that bomb when they were cleaning me and, and a nurse came to clean the, 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 the blood, the blood away. and all that from my face and head. Liz Doucette, a friend of mine from the BBC, called while they were cleaning the blood from my face to say that you have been selected by the Bonn Conference as the president of the new government of Afghanistan. So look at the, the twist of fates, you know. One, in one day from in, near to death. Not death. in one day, in half an hour. In half an hour. So then... You arrive, you, you make your way to Kabul, and you have a country which has been thrown back into the Middle Ages. The cities are destroyed, the jazz total, bars are long. Total, 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 total. We arrived in Kabul after I was uh, declared the president, and the country was uh, in total destruction, ladies and gentlemen. Total. Nothing to hang on to. But the international community helped us, the Americans, the Europeans, India, by the way, very, very much was among the first countries who came to help Afghanistan with, uh, with schools, with uh, financial resources, with uh, reconstruction activity. And uh, the Afghan flag was raised back all over the world. And we started our democracy, our constitution, our, the rights of women back and education back. Things were very nice till the Americans began to make mistakes again and turned and, us to what we are now. And even during your inauguration, your supporters traveling towards Kabul, they got bombed by the Americans. Even those people got bombed, yes, yes. And many killed. 
and people were killed, a lot of people were yeah. killed. So it's a mixed story from that day, from 2001 to today. We have a very happy story to tell to the world and to the Afghan people, and we have a very sad story to tell to the world and to the Afghan people. So to do, how do you balance this impossible double act? Because on one hand, American aid is obviously very important. Military uh, support from America was initially totally crucial. On the other hand, if they're just bombing people, they're alienating them, how did you manage to... They, you, see, you see, sometimes the Western media calls me anti-American. No, I'm not. I'm a very pro-American person. I'm a very pro-Western person. I'm an Eastern man with all the Eastern, um, you know, um, attributes and, 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 and qualities, but I'm also very much pro-West. My opposition to America, my stand against the United States was not because I did not like their way of life or anything. They were hurting Afghanistan by bombing our country, by uh, hitting our people in, in, in our villages, by taking prisoners, and by ignoring the sanctuaries outside of Afghanistan, outside of our country, from where we were getting hurt, we were getting uh, destroyed. And that brought me to a public opposition to the Americans, and I hope that will change. So let's be a bit more explicit about this. What you're saying is that the, uh, the Taliban were being nurtured and supported and armed by Pakistan. Look, Mr. Dalrymple, <laughs> my, my policy has been to be very kind to Pakistan when I'm in India. <laughs> and, and to be very, very kind to India when I'm in Pakistan. And I did that in the past 12 years. But facts are facts, let me tell you the truth. Yes, unfortunately, the sanctuaries were in Pakistan. They were coming to us from Pakistan. But I must tell everyone here, not from the Pakistani people. No. The Pakistani people treated us equally like themselves, like brothers and sisters when we were refugees there. They looked after us massively. Massively, massively nicely. My complaint is not for the, against the Pakistani people. I love them just like I love Indian people. And I'm sure the Indian people also love the Pakistani people the same way as, as they would love you. The complaint, the complaint is against the military intelligence establishment there. That part of it, not the rest. And that, should, that is what we should correct. And why do you think they did support the Taliban? What, I mean, it seemed to be uh, a self-destructive they don't want to be turned into a Taliban state themselves. They were, as the famous phrase goes, if you nurture vipers in your backyard, yes, soon yes. you will be bitten. Yes. Well, it's a, it's a story that goes back to, to uh, the past, to uh, the very deep cooperation between the United States and some Western allies and Pakistan, where... Uh, they tried to use religion as the best instrument to defeat the former Soviet Union. In other words, religion against communism. And the Pakistanis and the Americans and, I mean, the, gov the governments joined hands to use Islam as the most effective instrument against the former Soviet Union and communism. And the more they used that, the more radicalized they, it became. And, but Pakistan was doing it both in service to America and for its own purposes as well vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan, and later on vis-a-vis -vis India. And do you think that Al-Qaeda and so on would ever have happened if it hadn't have been for CIA support? Never. No, no, no. It was them that did it. Sure. Of course. And deliberate radicalization for political purposes. Exactly. Very deliberate radicalization for political objectives, where because we pay the price. Prior to that, Afghan Islam was very Sufi. And I, and I will tell you a story on this. And I will tell you. In 2013, I had my last visit to the United States as the president of Afghanistan. Always they, on my visits, treated me very, very well. On this particular visit, they arranged a dinner for me with uh, some of the most famous American intellectual types who were, who were also part of the policy-making setup in America. Among them was Mr. Uh, Brzezinski, big new Brzezinski. The, um, the, the age group uh, closer to me would know him very well. The younger lot, those who do politics and international relations may, may know his name. He, he was one of the 
fundamental architects of the use of Islamic radicalism against the former Soviet Union. And I told him, I said, Mr. Brzezinski, is it true that you have used uh, as a policy religious extremism to defeat the former Soviet Union and you called it the, the, the green belt? He said, yes, it is true. We did that, but we didn't call it the green belt. We called it the arc of crises around the Soviet Union. But I said, look at the cost. What immense cost have we paid in, in, in doing that? He said, it is no cost for America. Uh, historically, he said, the collapse of the Soviet Union is a lot more important than the creation of few radical elements. And then he said, of course, America doesn't suffer the consequence of that. You do in your part of the world, and that is not our concern. So that's how blatant they did that. So did you see American policy against Afghanistan as just careless or deliberately irresponsible? What was your view? Well, I hope it was uh, mistakes, because if I say it was deliberate, then things will turn up very bad. Uh, whatever it was, deliberate or mistakes, they have to correct it and correct it soon. And um, you, got, oddly, got, are said to have got on better with President Bush than you actually did with Obama. Is that true or not? Personally, yes. Personally, President Bush and I carried on very, very well. But work-wise, it was the same with both. It was U.S. policy that I had opposed, not the individuals. So Obama was a very respectable person, a very intelligent person, and, and a very um, polite and decent man. So was President Bush. Uh, but personally, President Bush and I were more friendly uh, than I and, and Obama. Or Obama and I were business to business. I mean, he was personally uh, cold, or did no, he regard you as Bush's man? Well, or? two different characters. Two different characters. Uh, uh, one was more a. Uh, uh, like a Nawab or a Khan, President Bush. The other one was more like a teacher in a school or something. <laughs> something like that. Um, so looking back, you were, you, you were president of Afghanistan for 12 years, 2002 to 2014. What, first of all, do you regard as your greatest achievements from those years? My greatest achievement or the... Well, it's wrong to say my greatest achievement. I think, I think it's the achievement of the Afghan people. The greatest achievement of the Afghan people was that the country was united immediately afterwards. Afghanistan became the home for all the Afghan people, and this is the achievement of the Afghan people. Our constitution, the liberation of women in the return of women to the workplace, uh, uh, the Afghan flag returning to the rest of the world, Afghan finding, Afghanistan finding its presence on the international community, education, massive improvement in education, millions of children going back to school, at least, 10, 000, at, at least 10,000 are right now in India. Our boys and girls studying here and democracy and um, um, uh, improvement in health services, that is the positive side. The sad side is the lack of peace, the lack of progress against extremism and violence for which we pay the price, but for which we are not entirely responsible. Regrets? Yes. I think we should have not adapted the free market economy. That was a mistake. In what way? In lots of ways. In lots of ways. We were a very underdeveloped country. We did not have proper administrative structure or the laws or the regulations to, to, to protect uh, uh, the economy. And it went into a free uh, for all thing where some people became billionaires overnight and others were remained as they were, so uh, that was a lesson. The two criticisms made of your administration, yes. firstly was that there was rampant corruption and not enough was done to right. stop that. What, right. what, what would your reply be to that? Right, right, right. Well, Afghanistan is uh, as corrupt as any country you can imagine. You know, the, uh, we are not more or less corrupt than the countries around us, or even in Europe. But, 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 the, but, but the, the big corruption, the big corruption in Afghanistan was not an Afghan corruption. It was the corruption of the U.S. money and contracts that they gave to people. They would, I once 
got a report from, from a friend of mine who said, a man is uh, in, the, uh, in, the, um, in custody of our legal authorities, and uh, you should look into his case. And I, found, and I called the attorney general. I said, do you have uh, such and such person in your custody? He said, yes, I haven't. I said, I want to see him. And this man was brought to me. And when he came to me, I was surprised. He was a very young person, very young person, very handsome, very smartly dressed in Afghan traditional dress. And I said, how old are you? He said, I'm 25. I said, you're 25? And I said, uh, but I said, you are a big businessman. How can a man in your age be a big businessman? He said he was 17 when the American Special Forces gave him his first contract. At 17, at the age of 17. Millions of dollars. And he said, eventually by the time he was 22, 23, the, con the contracts that they gave him were no less than $100 million each. Imagine. And then they, well, he was, for some reason, uh, there in the custody. So that's how the money was wasted. That's how the money was spent on wrong contracts. That's how some people rich, made rich overnight. And that's how some people were bombed overnight into nothingness. That was the difference that developed between the United States on these issues. Corruption was one of the issues, but more important was our civilian casualties, the casualties of the Afghan people, the common people. The, the other criticism that sometimes... So to answer your question on corruption, yes, we... In, in the delivery of services, it was our responsibility, the responsibility of the Afghan government. But on contracts, it was entirely foreign, not us. The um, other criticism sometimes made is that uh, under, under your rule, the heroin trade uh, revitalized again, having been wiped out by the Taliban, and that some of your own family members, such as Shah Wali, yes. was involved yes. in it. Yes, 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 yes. Well, the poppy cultivation in Afghanistan is the product of war. Before that, India knows that very well. Afghanistan is known for our dry fruits, our fruits, our anars, our angurs, our badams, and all of that. Now, why would a country that produces the best anars in the world, the best pomegranates in the world, the best badams in the world go to poppy growing? because of the displacement of millions of people into, into uh, refugee camps uh, outside of Afghanistan, the irrigation systems collapsing, and no people available to cultivate the land or to look after the, 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 the orchards. The easiest was to go to poppies, and the mafia, the international mafia, would, co would come to your doorstep to buy it from you. So it was cash money straight away at your doorstep. And that's how it cultivated and, and it grew. The Taliban, the last year of the rule of the Taliban, they completely uh, destroyed the, the, the uh, crop of the poppies. And when uh, we arrived, uh, it began to... Uh, it, let me put it this way. Where the Afghan government was in charge fully, there was no poppy. Where there were the largest number of foreign forces, poppies went up to the skies. Helmand is an example. We had 30,000 American and British troops, and poppies went up to the sky. And Mazar is another province where we were completely in charge, no foreign troops, there was no poppy there. Now you guess what it is. So moving forward, from 2014, around the same... same on, on my brother, on my brother, there was that, immense, there was that, that immense propaganda against my brother. And I called him. And I said, this is what the Americans are saying, the British are saying. He said, this is not true. And then you made a case against these in the, in the US Justice Department where they gave him uh, the details of, of having nothing there. And I called the American, the British embassy, uh, political leaders, and the intelligence service of both countries, the CIA and the MI6. And I asked them, what is it? Do you have anything? They said, no, this is only rumors and, and, and things like, what is it called, impression? Or uh, there's another word for that. But one day, suspicion. It, no, imp, uh, they said suspicion or impression, whatever, one of these things. One day in 2007, we were addressing a, a anti-narcotics conference in which I addressed the uh, Western community. I said, well, 
the poppies are grown in our country, but the money is in your banks. And when I said that, this propaganda stopped. They didn't go after me after that. So, so when you, by the, the time you retired from the presidency in 2014, the Taliban sheltering in Pakistan had made a comeback. They'd taken over about a third of the country. Yes, a bit more. A bit more. Since then, they've advanced further. Talk about what the current situation under your successor, Ashraf Ghani. It is, it is a, well, unfortunately, the country is not secure. Uh, we have not defeated extremism. The Taliban have taken more parts of the country. The, it's the same game played out. We hope that President Trump's announcement uh, on Pakistan will now see action on that front. Just talk about that, actually, for a second, because yes. President Trump, what, some would say one of the, 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 the few sensible decisions he's taken. Um, <laughs> Right, right. Is to, is to stop the ambiguity over Pakistani or ISI support of, exactly. of the Taliban. Exactly. And that was the reason I supported him after a long, long time of disagreement with America. We do support President Trump's uh, statement on Pakistan's um, use of extremism. And we hope that now they will take action. In other words, we hope now, now they will walk the talk. And what, what are your hopes and fears at the moment? Because the Taliban, I mean, it is very insecure. Places which I visited safely under your presidency are now impossible to yes, get to. Yes, yes, yes. Well, look, the Taliban are eventually Afghans. And as Afghans, we have to find a way with them. Uh, they're from our country, they're from our people, and we must find common ground and reach peace. But that peace will not come without Pakistan agreeing to peace and without our... Pakistan establishment forced to agree to peace, and with the Americans playing the right, the right, the right policy, the right game there. So if we don't have peace today in Afghanistan, I can say with great clarity and great conviction that it is because of the United States and Pakistan together. And what do you see as India's role in this? What would you like India to be doing now? In this difficult triangle between well, well, Pakistan well, well, well. and Afghanistan? India was the first country that we signed the strategic partnership agreement with in 2011 because Afghanistan wanted to be friends with India and Afghanistan wanted very much to be, to be um, in, in, in total cooperation uh, with India on all aspects of life. And India delivered exactly the same way to us, massive assistance to Afghanistan. India is not um, uh, traditionally a donor country. The, 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 the prisons here would know that. But India went out of its way and gave us over two and a half billion dollars in, in assistance and re reconstruction, roads and dams and education, all that. So it's a very, very strong relationship. We want to maintain that relationship. So India's role in Afghanistan is one that uh, brings us all sorts of uh, goodies uh, uh, from recently education. recently reports of military training of the Afghan forces in India. Yes, th th that started a long time back. That's not a new thing. Even in the time of the former king of Afghanistan, in the 1960s and 70s, India was training our, 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 our personnel. And uh, during my government, we made agreements and, and enhanced this cooperation. And the current government is doing the same thing. We want to maintain that and we want to strengthen that. And um, your own personal relationship with India, I, uh, I, there was a photograph which I saw on the net the other day of you being uh, seen in a Delhi bookshop buying a copy of Ghalib. Yes, yes, I went to Khan Market <laughs> the other day. I went to Khan Market and I, and I was looking for books. I had um, all other um, Indian um, writers that I loved uh, with me. Ghalib I had, but not many. So I went to buy Ghalib and I was looking uh, for him and I found him. I already have, uh, probably I can say with confidence, all of the books of, uh, of uh, Tagore with me. Uh, and I have read him completely, uh, Tagore, from, from, from his poems to Gitanjali to all the, the other little books that he has, a great, great writer. And I bought Ghalib, and uh, next time I'm there, I'll be looking for more. I've also seen, by the way, Kalidas uh, uh, in full, uh, a lovely poetry that he has. That, and I'm asking Indian readers to read Kalidas. It's a lovely book. Which one would you recommend? Cloud Messenger? Uh, well, the, you mean the translation? Kalidas? No, what would you... Well, I wish I remembered the name of the translator. I can tell you how the book looks, though. <laughs> it's a pink book 
with the tulip flower on it. <laughs> Buy that. And um, in your in your um, stay at the Jaipur Literature Festival, are we going to be seeing you at other sessions? Will you be Will you be going to see other other events, or are you going to? Very much. I, I hope so. I believe there is an award session later on. I'd like to be there. It's on Indian um, crafts and things, and so hopefully you'll be there. So if you if you allow me, I mean, uh, we would yes. be delighted, sir. <laughs> um, so final thing: um, the future of Afghanistan. How? What sort of solution? Before we open it up to, to the audience, what sort of solution would you see for your country? How can you heal these, these desperate, festering wounds? I will speak for the future of two countries here, Afghanistan and India, separately and together. The future of Afghanistan is going to be good because the Afghan people want it to be good. Because we have a younger generation of Afghans who are now rising up and getting educated and they want to have the, their country good and in their own hands. And I want that future, and I want that future, and, and I want that future in, in great friendship with our neighbors, including with Pakistan and the people of Pakistan. We want tremendous friendship and good relations. And we want it even more so than any other country with India because of the commonality that we have, because of the help that India has given us. But a word to the Indian youth as well. You come from a great civilization a great country of thousands of years of age. You have so much to give to the world. Together with your new industry, knowledge and technology, you also must share the depth of your civilization with the rest of the world. The depth of your civilization in the world. You have so much color and beauty in your country. Present that to the world. Uh, your traditional dresses, for example. I mean, the sari. Can you imagine? Does anyone else have a thing like that in the world? Nobody. And all other things that you have. So do that. And you are inherently a peace-loving country. And a freedom-loving country. And a tolerant country. You know, you are the melting pot of cultures, individuals, and civilizations. I must tell you something. All of you have heard of Barikullah Ali Khan, right? And Ustad Bismillah Khan, right? And uh, many more. You know, they are originally from Afghanistan. Both of them come from Ghazni province. But their, their abilities, their inner self, their intellect flourished in India. It was India that gave him the Shahnai to Bismillah Khan. It was India that gave Bari Ghulam Ali Khan that voice and the rags that he had. Cherish that and keep introducing it to the rest of the world as well. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, Hamid Karzai. I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, can we have the microphones out? So just to begin, this gentleman with the beard here. It's been an honor, sir, to hear from you. Uh, from Afghani writers like Khalid Hosseini or Pakistan uh, writers who write about Afghanistan and Pakistan like Ahmed Rashid, uh, we have known how, um, how much pain uh, there has been between the different tribes of Afghanistan like Hazaras, Uzbeks, and the, ma the majority tribes, which is Pashtuns. Uh, do you think your administration from 2002 to 2014 has somehow healed those wounds? Uh, I somehow healed those wounds and uh, brought them more together than they were before? Yes, yes, yes. We are a very united country. We are a very, very united country. And um, you see, this is a very important question. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me on this question. The unity of Afghanistan. Much of the news on Afghanistan comes from Western outlets. 
And then the India media also, unfortunately, repeats the same thing. Don't do that. Do your own stories on, Af on Afghanistan. We are a very united country. It's like any other country. We have our problems, we have our issues, but we have our centuries of living together and, 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 and life together. No, it's not, that's not true. Uh, good afternoon. So my question to you is that after wars Pakistan has faced, the people have a feeling of trauma. Yeah, they are feared. So as a president and a, and a person who f uh, future decides the future of a country, how far have you brought the people out of the trauma of wars, despite the... The Afghan people. Yeah, sorry, Afghanistan. The Afghan people. Yes. Right. It, well, even right on Pakistan, I agree with you. There are also people are in trauma and we should bring them out. Yes, wars. yes, yes. Yes, the trauma, the trauma of war has affected us very, very strongly. Very, very strongly. We see it in our families every day. I see it in my own children uh, every day. Bombs scare them. Uh, insecurity frightens them. Um, uh, uh, so this is an issue for us. The trauma of war and how to correct it will take time. First. Second, will take peace itself to come to get us out of the trauma of war. So peace and time will heal that. It's a process of healing, and I hope it begins very soon. Namaste, sir. Namaskar ji. <laughs> uh, we share our 26th uh, January Republic Day with you. We are Thank so you. fortunate to have you here. Thank you. And uh, since you studied in India for six years, yes. can you flu fluently speak Hindi? I can say something, I can say I can speak to you if you want to. So, you listen to the song and then I will ask you. Yes, listen to the song and then I will ask you. The song? Yes, I don't know. Okay. What song for you? That's a very lovely song. <laughs> and, and the movie is also Kabi Kabi. Yeah. It's a very lovely song. Very lovely song. Uh, well, um, there are. Uh, uh, I, I think one of the best Hindi songs is To Ganga Ki Mor Me Jamuna Kinar. Is it like that? Is it? And, yes. and many more. And many more. And I tell you. Uh, 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 Probably, uh, uh, let's, let me see. Have you seen uh, Guide, the movie? Yes. yes. Right? Yes. And uh, uh, that famous song in it, Aaj Pir Jeeni Ki Tamanna Hai, Aaj Pir Manne Ka Irada Hai. And so on. We truly admire your sense of humor and your sense of uh, belonging to India and uh, I mean talking so highly about a culture. Now let me ask you a question. Yes, please. Uh, that after you became president, what all changes you brought in the gender? Like uh, what all equality, I mean what all uh, rights you expanded to the women? One of our best achievements. Yes. One of our best achievements. You go to Afghanistan today, Afghanistan has a very vibrant media today. Extremely vibrant, open, free, and vibrant. And the majority of the personalities of our media are today women, younger women rising, and very well. We, when, we were, when we were making our constitution, the Afghan people decided in the constitution through our lawyer Jarga, the Grand Council of the Afghan people, to give women, by law, 27% of the parliamentary seats. So they have them. Now they are, they are actually 28% now in the parliament. And now we have millions of girls in school, uh, hundreds of thousands in, in universities, uh, PhDs. I, uh, we have a young Afghan girl here with us on, on this visit who got educated in Afghanistan and then he went, she went to the US for the studies. So on gender, the country has done very well. Hello. Over here. Thank Hi. you for your words. They were beautiful. Um, my question is a bit light and super quick. 
if someone were to make a movie on you, who would you want to play you? They made a movie of me uh, in America with uh, ben, Kingsley. The, the ben Kingsley playing me. But, but that with, was with Brad more Pitt. A, but that was more a sort of an American uh, story of war and um, uh, things like that. If, if, if a movie was made of me in India, Nasiri Shah would be the right person. <laughs> kind of looks like me, you know. Or, or, or I should say, I look like him, better put it this way. Mehman, jo hamara hota hai, wo jaan se pyara hota hai. You have talked a lot about our friendship with the India and uh, this uh, Afghan. And uh, I very much love of the Afghan people. And one thing I want to know, regarding this uh, Taliban people did this uh, Buddhist sculpture, what the position is now, I want to know about and what your government has done it, something good. About, about what? Buddhist sculpture, what was the... Oh, Buddha. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, to, to your poem about Mehman, I will say this. Ye mulaqat ek bahana hai. Pyar ka silsila purana hai. <laughs> well, the destruction of the Buddha was one of the greatest losses of our, of our century, as a matter of fact, of our civilization, the world civilization. And uh, such a painful thing. Uh, we have been thinking all along whether we should rebuild it or whether we should leave it, leave it as it is. I wish all of you will find time one day to go and stand there. When you stand on this hill here, the Buddha is on the other hill there. Though the space is now empty within that mountain, but you can see the image, it comes to you. So there is an argument in, in our ar archaeological experts, and we've been concerned with the Japanese as well, and some Indians, whether we should build it and leave it for centuries later to become a relic again, or whether we should leave it empty and see the presence of it as it was for centuries. We, we can't make a decision on that. I should just maybe interject there that Bamiyan is about the safest place in Afghanistan. It it's is. Still, it is still somewhere you can visit. The safest and place. And although Afghanistan sounds like a daunting place, in fact, it's only an hour's flight from Delhi. It's nearer than Bombay. And you can get another flight to Bamiyan, there's a little twin prop. Exactly, exactly. It's an amazing trip. And there's exactly. an amazing hotel where you can get sushi, even. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good afternoon. Yes, please. Gentleman with the hat. Good afternoon, uh, former afternoon. President uh, Karzai, sir. Uh, my question to you is, you are talking about a lot of about Indian films. And I think that, w that, is, that has been the great linkage between India and Afghanistan for a long time ago. Uh, talking about Devan and, and uh, one uh, Kabuliwala was one, one of those Kabuliwala, movies. Tagore, yes. yes uh, so that was one of those movies. So where do you see the road ahead uh, with uh, Pak uh, Afghanistan and India moving ahead in curbing uh, the aggressive nature around this uh, subcontinent section and also maintaining the peace process ahead in this uh, important subcontinent portion? It's a journey, sir, that we started some years ago. It is a journey that's carrying on. And we will reach the end of the road on this journey, which means peace and stability for Afghanistan and the region one day soon, hopefully. I'm afraid we have time for no more questions, but please show your appreciation of President Karzai. <laughs>